Why don't you turn to Psalm 106, Psalm 106. We're going to read the first three verses and then the last nine verses. I want you to notice beginning in verse 1, Praise ye the Lord, O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? Who can show forth all his praise? Blessed are they that keep judgment, and he that doeth righteousness at all times. Now skip ahead to verse 40. Therefore was the wrath of the Lord kindled against his people, insomuch that he abhorred his own inheritance. And he gave them into the hand of the heathen, and they that hated them ruled over them. Their enemies also oppressed them, and they were brought into subjection under their hand. Many times did he deliver them, but they provoked him with their counsel, and were brought low for their iniquity. Nevertheless, he regarded their affliction when he heard their cry, and he remembered for them his covenant, and repented according to the multitude of his mercies. He made them also to be pitied of all those that carried them captives. Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the heathen, to give thanks unto thy holy name, and to triumph in thy praise. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting, and let all the people say, Amen, praise ye the Lord. If I was to title the message tonight, it would be, What a Revolting Development That Is. Only you old people know where that comes from. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now in the name of the Lord Jesus. And I beg you again tonight for the filling of the Holy Spirit. Use the word of God to challenge our hearts, to convict us, as well as to comfort us. But God, if there's one without Christ, may they come to Jesus. Lord, for the saved, I pray that you would convict us, that our walk be what it ought to be, for the glory of our God. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Back in the 1950s, there was a television show called... Uh, good night. I forgot the name of the show. Uh, Riley was the, William Bendix played in it. Tell me. Life of Riley. I don't know why I couldn't think of that. Life of Riley. Uh, but he also did the radio show in the early 50s, latter part of the 40s. Uh, and then he starred in the TV show. Now, that's back when TVs were that big. And you, at, if you had a good TV, you got three channels, ABC, NBC, and CBS, and that was it. Uh, he, he, William Bendix played the part of a man who riveted on airplanes. He worked in an airplane factory, uh, but he was always in trouble. He was always trying to come up with some scheme to make things better in life or something better in the home, stuff like that. And in every case, he would botch it up. And of course, he'd, he'd have to come down to where he apologized, just like today. He would apologize about things, uh, but uh, he would always, at the end of the program, when he finds himself surrounded by people looking at him because he did something stupid or something like that, he would say, what a revolting development that is. Now, when you read this particular psalm, it's interesting for a number of reasons. One is, if you read the first three verses and the last two verses, you have absolutely no idea what goes on in the rest of the psalm. For again, we go back to Psalm 106, verse 1. He starts out, praise ye the Lord. Give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? Who can show forth all his praise? Blessed are they that keep judgment, and he that doeth righteousness at all times. And then in the last two verses, he says, Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the heathen to give thanks unto thy holy name, and to triumph in thy praise. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. And let all the people say, Amen. Praise ye the Lord. That sounds great. But you look at verse 40. And verse 40 lets you know that what's in between those verses I just read is not good. As a matter of fact, I couldn't help it as I read this passage again. What a revolting development that is. For it says in verse 40, Therefore was the wrath of the Lord kindled against, now notice this, his people insomuch that he abhorred his own inheritance. Now, that's hard for a lot of people to swallow today. It's hard for a lot of people to take. In this day, when we tell ourselves that God understands us the way we are, he really doesn't mind. He's all about love. He's not about judgment. That tells you they don't have an idea who God is, by the way. Uh, they, matter of fact, we had that billboard up in town a couple of years ago that said, the Lord is not mad at you for any reason. 
Even though the scripture says the Lord is angry with the wicked every day. Even though Romans chapter 1 and verse 18 declares, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now, you may say about the passage that we read today, well, that's in the Old Testament. Well, that's true, and I appreciate your ability to be able to discern the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. But you need to understand, God does not change from the Old Testament to the New Testament. God is exactly the same God. For the Bible says, for I am the Lord, I change not. And in the New Testament, he declares this, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And I want you to notice this, and is profitable. Not was profitable and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You see, this psalm is just as much for the church of Jesus Christ today as what it was for Israel in their day. It's just as much for us and the warnings are just as real. Like in James 4, 4, when he declares, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? And whosoever therefore will be the friend of the world is the enemy of God. In Revelation 2, 16, he calls on the church at Pergamos to repent or else I will come quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Or in Sardis in Revelation 3, 3, he says, repent. And then he says, if therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief. And again, he tells the church at Laodicea, uh, whom the Lord loveth, he, uh, not, that's the wrong verse. He says, I'm going to have to look at it, Re Revelation chapter 3 and verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Since we realize that these Old Testament stories, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, were recorded for us, for our admonition that we not do the same things they did back in the Old Testament. Because God has not changed. Now I want you to notice some truths here from Psalm 106. Number one, God provides salvation for man. Notice in verses 8 through 10, he says this, Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power to be known. He rebuked the Red Sea also, and it was dried up. So he led them through the depths as through the wilderness. He saved them from the hand of him that hated them and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. God provides salvation for mankind. And thank God he did that in sending his son to die on the cross to pay for our sin. The Bible says this, the faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Jesus' own testimony was this, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Man needs a Savior. Jesus Christ is that Savior, and He is the only Savior. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In verse 21, the Bible says, they forget God, their Savior, which had done great things in Egypt. He's provided salvation by putting his son on the cross of Calvary to die in our place to pay our sin debt. For the wage of sin is death. You see, had he not taken our sins upon himself, we'd have no payment and we surely can't pay for our own. It would take a sinless sacrifice and none of us meet the qualifications of that. But Jesus shed his blood as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. The Bible says in the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanses us from all sin. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. And if you'll come to Jesus Christ, trust him as your savior. He'll give you eternal life, the forgiveness of sins. He'll adopt you into his family. You will belong to him. The Bible declares for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works as any man should boast. So one point we see in all this that God provides salvation for man. Here was Israel, they were in Egypt, they were in slavery, and God redeemed them and he set them free. That's what God does. Not only that, we find from this, this uh, chapter that some people are his and some are not. If you look beginning at verse 35, the scripture says this, But were mingled among the heathen and learned their works, and they served their idols which were a snare unto them. 
Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils and shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and their daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. Thus were they defiled with their own works and went a-whoring with their own inventions. Therefore was the wrath of the Lord kindled against, notice this, His people. Some people are His and some people are not. I'm not talking about the Calvinistic false doctrine uh, line where people have no ability to take God as Savior. Listen, the light has shined upon every man, the Bible says. And God gives an invitation to whosoever will, not whosoever must. Whosoever will be saved. Thank God for His marvelous grace. Amen. But the reality is some people are His and some aren't. Well, who aren't His? Those that haven't been born again. See, when you were born with the fleshly birth, you were not born into the family of God. You became part of the human race when you were born. But, dear friend, to be born into the family of God requires a spiritual birth. Jesus said, that which is more of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not, I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Now, that's absolutely vitally important. We understand that. You remember Jesus was talking to the religious leaders in John chapter 8 and verse 44. And he said to them, you're of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. But isn't it interesting? He's talking to religious people. And he says, you're of your father the devil. That's why you need the new birth, so that God can become your father. And that's what happens when you get born again. The new birth is absolutely essential to go to heaven. You know, heathen people, religious people, they need the new birth. I don't care who they are. Nobody's going to heaven because they're a Baptist. Nobody's going to heaven because they're a Methodist or Presbyterian or Nazarene or Church of God. I don't care. You name us all. You don't get to heaven by belonging to a church. You get to heaven by being born again. Amen. You must have Christ as your Savior. There are a lot of people who've been baptized who are going to end up in hell because baptism doesn't save you. There are going to be a lot of church members burning in hell because church membership does not save you. Only Jesus Christ saves. Make that absolutely plain. Now, I know some of you may be thinking, preacher, why? Man, we heard some of that this morning and you're giving again tonight. But there are people watching on the Internet right now who've never heard it the first time. And they need to hear it. They need to be reminded. I don't know who's watching us right now. We're on four different venues as far as the Internet's concerned with the services. And they need to hear it again. And by the way, it doesn't hurt for Christians to hear it again too. Amen. I mean, I'm not so naive to think that everybody here necessarily is saved. I mean, really, the Bible tells us uh, Jesus told the parable about the enemy of the farmer coming in and sowing tares among the wheat. And Jesus told the disciples, you can't tear the tares out because if you do, you'll hurt the good wheat. You see, you can't always tell just like they didn't, the other disciples didn't know that Judas was the traitor and the betrayer and the son of perdition. They didn't know that. Only Jesus knew that. You don't know who's saved, but God does. The only one you can be sure about is yourself. And you need to get that settled. Now, I look at people, and it's not that I'm standing here thinking you're all lost. No, I, I want to believe that you're all saved. But I'm not so naive to think that everybody here has truly been born again. You must be born again. You see, God still saves sinners, and some people are His, and some are not. Now, that leads us to the third point. What on earth can His people, those who've been born again, what can they do to receive His wrath and even be abhorred by him. Now, this is a picture that troubles a lot of church members. How in the world could... Now, look what he says again in verse 40. Therefore was the wrath of the Lord kindled against his people, insomuch that he abhorred his own inheritance. Now, I've pastored long enough to know that there, I've met a lot of people in life who have been so disappointed when their children have gotten into wickedness and would not turn around that it absolutely has disgusted them. It doesn't mean they don't love them, but they're absolutely disgusted with the lifestyle of their children who they love. But they must stand against their sin. I know it's difficult, but that's the way God is too. When God's people get into sin, God's not pleased with that. 
He chastens, he scourges. We know that. We'll say more about that a little later. Well, what on earth could they possibly do to get to the place where God would abhor his own inheritance? I mean, that is a revolting development. When you think of God's people being so much in the world or in sin that God himself would abhor his own inheritance. Well, we have a number of things he tells us about. Number one, they judged him according to their present circumstances. If you look at verses 12 through 14, the scripture says, Then believed they his words, they sang his praise. They soon forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. What happened to his people to make this revolting development? It was this. They were judging God according to their present circumstances. Now, a lot of Christians do that today, too. If they lose their health, oh, now they're mad at God. If they lose their finances, lose their job, now they're mad at God. And boy, they love to say God is good when everything's going well, but they have a hard time saying it when things aren't going well. But God is good all the time. Now, I really hate to hear people say, you know, well, praise the Lord anyhow. No, praise the Lord, not anyhow. Praise the Lord. It's like when you say praise the Lord anyhow, he doesn't deserve it. He deserves praise all the time. God's good all the time. Even when you're going through things that hurt, even when you're going through a hard time, God still deserves praise. Don't judge him according to your present circumstances. You remember Israel, when God got them out of Egypt, all those miracles that God performed to get them out of Egypt. And when it came to cross the Red Sea, he put a pillar of fire between the Egyptians and the Israelites. He parted the Red Sea, got Israel across. Then he allowed the Egyptians to cross and God swallowed up the army with the Red Sea itself. Three days later, three days, not three months, not three years, not 30 years. Three days later, they come to a place where water and the water is bitter. What a great opportunity. You think this is the time to say, God... Do something for us again. This is great. That's not what they said. They complained. Oh, God's brought us out in the wilderness to kill us in the wilderness. What did God? We were back in Egypt. And they did that throughout their trial over and over and over again. When things weren't going like they wanted them to go, they complained. Read through Exodus. Read through Numbers over and over again. They judged him according to their present circumstances. How hypocritical. Believers ought to know better than that. The scripture has warned us. Matter of fact, Jesus warned us in the parable of the wise man and the foolish man. Both the wise man and the foolish man in John chapter 7 heard the word of God. The wise man obeyed it. The foolish man did not. So Jesus likened the wise man to be a man who built his house upon a stone, a rock. And the foolish man was a man who built his house upon the sand. Now for both of these men... The rains came, the floods came, the storm broke on both of these men. Now the wise man's house stood, the foolish man's house did not stand because the one man had obeyed the word of God and the other one haven't. But the point was this, they both went through storms. It rains on the just and the unjust. When tornadoes hit, Christians get their houses hit too. When the floods come, Christians get their houses flooded too. And I want you to know God is good in all of it. You don't judge him according to your present circumstances. He's always God. He's always good. He's always right. Not only that, they were unhappy with their calling. Take a look at verses 16 through 18, where the scripture reads, They envied Moses also in the camp. And Aaron, the saint of the Lord, the earth opened and swallowed up Dathan and covered the company of Abiram. And a fire was kindled in their company, and the flame burned up the wicked. Now, Dathan and Abiram were part, they were both Levites. And they were from the families that had a part in handling the furniture in the the tabernacle. They had a special calling in their life that nobody else had. Now, when I say handled it, obviously, they didn't move it by touching it because God provided rings on the piece of each furniture for them to put a pole through, pick them up and carry them on their shoulders. But they had a special job given to them by God, but that didn't satisfy them. They were jealous about Moses because Moses talked with God. Moses got the message of God. Moses was the man that God used to lead them, but they wanted their job. 
They wanted somebody else's job. They didn't like it that they were busy. Listen, just to serve Lord in any way ought to be a blessing to any Christian. I don't care if it's, if it's cleaning the bathrooms. I don't care if it's picking up paper around the place. I don't care what it is, man, to be able to do anything to serve the Lord ought to be a privilege to God's people. But there have been a lot of people over the years who've made the mistake of wanting to do somebody else's job. Do what God's called you to do. That's it. And I know my home church, bless the Lord, I thank God for their testimony. One thing personally I think that they probably made a mistake in over the years was this. Whenever a pastor would resign, they would wait an entire year before they'd pick out their, their uh, pastoral committee to go out and look for a candidate. A year before they even started looking. Unfortunately, what happens then, you end up with sheep leading the sheep. They're doing the job of the shepherd, and when a shepherd comes in, they don't want to give up the shepherd's position. And you see, that can create some major problems. So the shepherd can't do what shepherds are supposed to do, what pastors are supposed to do, and that's bad. How many deacons have messed up not being content to be a deacon, but want to end up running the church and doing what the pastor's supposed to do? That's messed up a lot of churches, messed up a lot of homes. What a shame. I mean, hey, in the home, God has, set up the, uh, God has set up what the home is to be like. The wife is to be in subjection to the husband. It's what it says. But how many women want the husband to be subjected to them? You get it all backwards, man. You're sowing the, not only the seeds of discord, but of ruin for the family. Be content with what God's given you to do. Amen. And do it. Man, let God use you. God's given you a voice to sing. Use it to sing to his glory be ashamed to waste that a good voice where you could serve the Lord with singing and never sing and be a blessing. Maybe we ought to ask God, to, we ought to ask God to take the voice away and give it to somebody who'll use it for his glory. I'm just simply saying, man, serving the Lord, but they were unhappy with their calling. So we see two things already. They judge God according to their present circumstances. They were unhappy with their calling. Number not third thing, they came up with their own God. You look at verse 19, the scripture says this, they made a calf in Horeb and worshiped the molten image. Thus they changed their glory into the similitude of an ox that eateth grass. They forget God their savior, which had done great things in Egypt. Now you know the story, it's in Exodus chapter 32, where Moses goes up into the mount to pray. He's been there for 40 days. The people come to Aaron, Moses' brother. Aaron, who is the high priest, he is supposed to be the spokesman for Moses, to help Moses, but Moses is definitely the leader. Matter of fact, Moses got, a, uh, got the people to say that they would obey God and everything that he said before he ever went up into the mountain. But here they are. They come to Aaron. They say, we don't know what's happened to Moses, but up make us gods that brought us up out of Egypt. Well, they knew who brought them out of Egypt. Why would you make gods and say they brought you out of Egypt when they knew God brought them out of Egypt? And so Aaron, here's where Aaron messes up big time because he's supposed to be representing God. And instead of rebuking the people like he should have, he said, bring in all your jewelry. And he cast it all into the, the pot and melted it all together. And he made the molten calf. And then he said to the people, tomorrow is a feast day to the Lord. And that's in all capitals, which means he's saying Jehovah. And that mess that went on down there was in the name of Jehovah. And Jehovah had nothing to do with it. As a matter of fact, had Moses not prayed up in that mount, for Israel. God said, I'm going to go to destroy him. Moses begged him not to destroy God's people. God said, I'll make of you a great nation. But Moses still prayed for him. Had he not prayed for them, God would have killed them all. So they made their own gods. Hey, we got a lot of people making their own gods today. They have a God that they made up in their own mind. Their God of love doesn't send anybody to hell. Doesn't judge anybody. Doesn't, doesn't judge anybody. He's happy with everybody. Because they basically got a God who's like the God of the book, The Shack. Just some sweet-natured older lady who loves rock and roll and other things, and she's got a sweet disposition, and that's their God, but that's not the God of the Bible. That is as bad as making a molten calf like Aaron did. 
and the parties that they have and the rock music that they play and all the carnality that's part of that kind of wicked false worship is not pleasing to God that's wrong. What's sad is there are some truly born again people that participate in that kind of stuff just like there were Israelites that participated in that idolatry. What a revolting development when you've got people that are judging God according to their present circumstances. They're unhappy with their calling. They come up with their own God. How sad that is. In Exodus 20, verses 3 through 5, God had said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the, under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. God is holy. Yes, God's love, but God is holy. God hates sin. His love is a holy love. Again, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. So they judged him by their present circumstances. They were unhappy with his calling. They came up with a God of their own making. And then fourthly, they despised God's best. If you look at verse 24, the scripture says this, yea, they despised the pleasant land. They believed not his word, but murmured in their tents and hearkened not unto the voice of the Lord. Verse 24, 26, therefore he lifted up his hand against them to overthrow them in the wilderness. You know the story of 12 spies being sent into the promised land. And they were in there for 38 days. When they came back out of the land, they all gave the same testimony at first. They all said that the land is as God said it was. It was a land flowing with milk and honey. And they brought back the clusters of grapes to show that the land was exactly what God said. But then the ten said, but there are giants in the land and we can't take it. Now, you know, Joshua and Caleb, they said, let's go. Everything's like God said. And he's promised that let's trust him. But they said, no, we're like grasshoppers in their sight. We can't take it. And so God said, all right, you're not going in. You're going to wander around a year for every day that you were in the land. A year for every day. And everybody 20 years old and upwards going to die. Whoa. They despised God's best. And when God said they couldn't go in, they wept that night. The next day they got up and said, let's go in. After all, God's promised us the land. Too late. Too late. Too late. Moses told them, you can't go in now. So they went up to fight, and a bunch of them started dying that first day. God told them they were going to die. God keeps his word. They could have had the land then. God had it all ready for them. But think about this. The Canaanites, those pagan heathens, they got to enjoy the land God had prepared for his people for the next 38 years because of that. You say, preacher, I thought they were in the wilderness 40. They were in there, but it took them a year and a half to two years before they finally got to where they could take the people in. They had to go to Mount Sinai, get some things settled there and so on beforehand. So here they are. There are Christians that are like that. When we are a peculiar people, we're a holy priesthood, we're a special generation, and we don't want to be. We don't want to be. We want to be just like the world. We adopt the world's speech. We adopt the world's music. We adopt the world's entertainment. And man, we love it. And we wonder, why does the power of God seem to be gone in our churches? Well, maybe that is exactly the reason. God gives us his best. No, I don't want the King James Bible because after all, that's so hard to understand. You got these and thous in there. Man, that's just you. How is that hard to understand? I've never had a hard time understanding that. Well, you got words that end in E-T-H. All right, so cut off the E-T-H. What does it say? Pretty simple. This isn't, this isn't rocket science, Huntsvillians. You engineers, you can handle this. I was at the chiropractor, oh, this is about a year ago now, and there was a guy came in and he asked the question. 
I, I didn't know him, never met him before, anything like that. And he's, he asked the question, I think, to the chiropractor. Uh, he said, you know, I got this young lady that uh, has trusted Christ as Savior, and I'm trying to figure out what would be the best translation to give her. And the, and the chiropractor looked at me and said, what do you think, Brother Allison? And I said, get her a King James Bible. The guy said, well, she'll never understand that. I said, she's saved, she'll understand it. That won't be a problem. Language isn't that tough. I said, I can never tell her to read that. Why not? My kids learned it from, that's the only Bible they've ever learned. And they've done fine right along. Good night. It's not that difficult. You don't even need to know Greek and Hebrew to understand your King James Bible. Praise the Lord. But you got peculiar people that are supposed to be a peculiar people that they don't want God's best. They despise their Bible. They despise his church. They despise spiritual things. Don't know what it is to be faithful to the house of God. I'll tell you, one of the things that happened to me when I got saved, besides cleaning up my mouth, it changed what I liked. I wanted to sing the hymns. I wanted to sing praise to his name. I wanted songs that lifted up his name. And I'd been a rock and roll disc jockey and a country western disc jockey. And guess what? You get saved, you get a new song too. I want the songs that exalt him and that glorify him. Uh, there's something wrong with songs that all they do is move the body. If they're just moving the body, man. All you got is a carnal song. I don't care what words you put to it. Right music is just as important as the right words because music sends a message. That was extra. I hadn't, didn't have it down here to say, but there you go. What else did they do? They mixed with the unholy religious crowd. Take a look at verses 28 and 29. For then it says, they joined themselves also unto Baal Peor, and they ate the sacrifices of the dead. Thus they provoked him to anger with their inventions, and the plague break in upon them. So they joined unto Baal Peor. What a wicked, wicked false god that is. And why would they be joining with it? In the New Testament, he tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 17, he says, Come out from among them, be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. I have never taken part in one of those community watch, and not watch night services, what do you call that early in the morning? Sunrise services, never done it. I'm not going to get together with a bunch of people that don't even believe the gospel, don't believe Jesus Christ is God, don't believe the Bible is the word of God. Got no business being with them. I don't care what denomination they claim. Amen. Man, God's people are to be a separate people. Notice what else they did. Verses 34 through 36, they mingled with the heathen and learned their works. Verse 34, they did not destroy the nations concerning whom the Lord commanded them, but were mingled among the heathen and learned their works, and they served their idols, which were a snare unto them. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils. They mingled with the heathen and learned their works. In Nehemiah chapter 13, Nehemiah got very active about this. You remember when the heathen tried to, tried to get into the city of God on the Sabbath day. He didn't want them anywhere around there, didn't want them hanging around the gates, nothing like that. The problem is you start mingling with the heathen and that which is their wickedness doesn't seem so bad anymore. That's what makes a lot of these so-called sitcom comedies so dangerous because it gets people laughing at wickedness, at immorality, at perversion. And it's one of the reasons why when our kids were growing up, if they got to see a cartoon, it couldn't have rock music in it, couldn't have witchcraft in it. That wiped out almost all the cartoons that there were. Neither one. I didn't want them liking witches. No, we never burned a witch at the stake. As a matter of fact, not as many people were ever burned at the stake for being witches as what the world wants you to think today. Bunch of liars. That's, they're rewriting history about all kinds of things. There might have been one, two, three, or four, but that, I guarantee you there weren't any more than that. Absolute wickedness. Not, then they topped it off by giving their children to it. For verse 37 again, he says, Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils and shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and of their daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood, thus were they defiled with their own works and went a whoring with their own inventions. 
You see, one of the problems of loving the world is you end up raising your children in the world and they start loving the world. You know, God says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You've got to be careful what music they listen to. You've got to be careful where you allow them to go. For the life of me, I, I look at this and you see these people, uh, their children ended up, they sacrificed their children, their daughters and their sons to devils. Now what had, that had to do with was the worship to Baal. Now Baal was a, an idol that had arms that stood out like this. They'd put a raging fire underneath those arms to get them red hot. And then the mothers would come in with the little babies that they brought to sacrifice to Baal and they'd place their little babies on those red hot arms. You say, that is so perverted, that is so wicked. Yeah, and you not only had the heathen doing it, but you had God's people that were doing it too. And yet I see people sacrificing their children on the altar of the world's music. It comes around prom time, and I can't believe. Here is a mom and dad, has a good Christian little girl, and they dress her up in a strapless dress, send her out with a young teenager whose hormones are raging, and they think, surely nothing's going to happen here. What kind of idiocy is that? That's like giving a child a cell phone, letting them be in, in their room alone to be on a cell phone where they can be with their friends and anybody that's on the internet 24 hours a day. What is wrong with you? You see, really, we're not much different today than what Israel was back then. And so he says, therefore, was the wrath of the Lord kindled against his people insomuch that he abhorred his own inheritance. Therefore, because of all those things, now I want you to note very quickly, their punishment was here and not hereafter. In verses 26 and 27, he said, Therefore he lifted up his hand against them to overthrow them in the wilderness, to overthrow their seed among the nations. In the book of Judges, you'll see God often bringing either the Philistines or the Midianites or the Amalekites down upon Israel because of their sin. Their punishment was here and not hereafter. In verses 41 through 43, and he gave them into the hand of the heathen and uh, they that hated them ruled over them. Their enemies also oppressed them and they were brought into subjection under their hand. Scripture says in Hebrews chapter 12, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourges every son whom he receiveth. Two parts of the chastening here. One is the chastening, the other is a scourging. Scourgings are always severe. The chastening of the, by the way, God's chastening is usually with God's word. That's why it's good to have a preacher who's willing to get up and give the scripture and chasten sinful actions, sinful attitudes, things like that by the preaching of the word of God. But if people don't listen, then God brings on the scourging. And buddy, that's where it gets tough. There's an awful lot of scourging that would never take place if God's people get right when they heard the word of God the first time. But their punishment was here and not hereafter. The Bible declares... Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. There are just a lot of problems and defeats that Christians have that they never would have had if they'd have just got right with God. Last thing, God wants you to return now. If you're one of those people that you know as a Christian, you're not doing the things that you're supposed to be doing, you're not walking right with him. You've got things in your life that shouldn't be there. God wants you to get right with him now. He doesn't want you to wait till next Friday. Doesn't want you to wait till next Sunday. Doesn't want you to wait three months from now, three weeks from now, till you get everything straightened out. The way you get things straightened out is first get them straightened out with the Lord. If you'll notice in verses 43 through 45, many times did he deliver them, but they provoked him with their counsel. They were brought low for their iniquity. Nevertheless, he regarded their affliction. When he heard their crying, he remembered for them his covenant and repented according to the multitude of his mercies. God wants to be merciful to us. God wants to forgive. God wants us to have that close walk relationship with him, but that's not going to happen when we allow sin in our life and don't get right about it. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, he says, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, 
we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. Then in verse 9, he says that we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Apart from repentance, there can be no renewed fellowship. You don't lose your salvation, but there's no renewed fellowship, not that closeness that you can have with a good walk with the Lord. Think about these people. How could they end up with such a revolt in development to have the God who redeemed them, the God who saved them, his wrath poured out against his own people to where he would even abhor his own inheritance because they wouldn't get right. What did they do? They judged God according to their present circumstances. They were unhappy with their calling. They came up with their own God. They despised God's best. They mixed with the unholy religious crowd. They mingled with the heathen and learned their works. And they gave their children over to it. That is a revolting development. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. I pray you deal with hearts, please. Father, I pray for any that's listening, whether it be here in the auditorium, over the internet, that's without Christ, that have never been born again, I pray they'd come to Jesus tonight and be saved. God, I pray for Christians tonight that we'd be careful not to allow those things into our lives that are contrary to your word, that are sin, that, oh God, brings you to this place that we see here where you would abhor your own inheritance. Move upon our hearts tonight, I pray, and God will thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name I ask it.